Welcome to r slash malicious compliance, where a very smart doctor outsmarts a very stupid patient. Our next Reddit post is from Yatisa. This story takes place a few years back when I was doing a clinical rotation in phlebotomy for my degree in medical laboratory science. For those who don't know, phlebotomy is the art of drawing blood. I was placed in the emergency department of a local hospital, practicing poking patients and drawing their blood. All the staff knew that my snow white scrubs meant that I was a student, but some patients took that to mean that I was a physician. One night, I happened to walk by an exam room where an altercation was taking place between a patient, Mr. Smith, and a very calm registered nurse. Altercations were a fairly common occurrence in the emergency room, but I was still pretty green, so it was hard not to stop and listen in. The nurse said, I've been doing this for 30 years, Mr. Smith. I can assure you. I don't care how long you've been doing this. I want a doctor to place my IV. Mr. Smith, if you hold still, I promise that I'll have your IV in in a flash. You'll hardly feel a thing. Are you deaf or just stupid? I want... At this point, the man catches sight of me loitering in the hallway. I want her to place my IV. Flabbergasted, I say, but I can't thread IVs. I only know how to draw blood. The nurse said, sir, she's just a student. This affront seemed to put the patient into overdrive, and he began slamming his fist on the bed rail, screaming for a doctor. The nurse quietly took me aside and asked me to go fetch one of the physicians on duty. I ran to get the kindest doctor because I was afraid of getting snapped at by the other doctors working that night. I'll call him Dr. Anderson. Dr. Anderson patiently listened to my explanation, wordlessly grabbed an IV kit out of the cupboard, and followed me to the patient's room. We could hear the patient still throwing his tantrum as we walked down the hall. As soon as Dr. Anderson stepped into the room in his white coat, the patient switched off his temper tantrum like a light and breathed a heavy sigh of relief. Finally, he said, and shot a smug smile at his nurse. Dr. Anderson said with a big, friendly smile, Hello, Mr. Smith. I hear that you want a doctor to place your IV. Well, I haven't... (laughs) Well, I haven't done this since medical school, so that's, what, 25 years ago now? I might be a little rusty, but I'm happy to give it a shot. (laughs) Nurse, will you please position the patient's head? I'm going for the jugular. Suddenly, the patient decided that he didn't want a doctor to place his IV after all, and the nurse with 30 years experience placing IVs would do just fine. So the reason why I was laughing so hard during this story is, as I was reading it, I was thinking to myself in the back of my mind, huh, that's strange. Why would he want a doctor to put his IV in? Because I would assume that doctors don't put a lot of IVs in. I would think that they get nurses to do that because that's kind of like, you know, the nurse's job to do that type of work. So actually, wouldn't a nurse have more experience with IVs than a doctor? (laughs) So I was delighted to read that, yes, r slash, you're correct. However, I was not expecting the doctor to go for the jugular. I wonder if that was to intentionally scare this guy, or if it was simply a matter of convenience because the jugular vein is really big and really easy to insert an IV into, so for a doctor with little experience, then that would be like the safest route for him. Maybe a little bit of both. Maybe it's both effective and a way to scare this patient. Down in the comments, we have this story from EMB. My girlfriend, who's a nurse, has almost the exact same story. <laughs> <laughs> when the doctor showed up and asked my girlfriend for a step-by-step instruction <laughs> instruction on how to place an IV, the patient finally agreed to let the nurse do it. Our next Reddit post is from Cycling Frenchie. I recently started a new job, and one of the perks is that if you work late, you can have a free dinner and take an Uber back home. However, I much prefer renting an electric bike back home. It's faster, better for the environment, fun, and a great way to decompress after a long day's work. After a month of that, I submit my expense report, but they refuse to pay back the bike ride, saying that I need to use an Uber instead. This annoyed me, so I decided to use an Uber for the following month and make sure to choose executive each time. Next month, my late night ride expenses increased by almost five times. Needless to say, they strongly encouraged me to get back on the bike and offered to buy me a subscription if available. 
Man, OP, if you got them to turn around so quickly, why not just try to get them to buy you an entire new bicycle? I mean, if they're reimbursing you 100 bucks a month, then depending on how long you work there, it might be cheaper for them. Our next Reddit post is from Raven Crow. When I was in high school, I worked at my local GameStop, and this is my favorite story. The malicious compliance was minor, but I thought the situation was quite funny and absurd. I worked in a very small store in a wealthy town with a bunch of suburban Karens. So, outside of the holidays, we typically only had two people on a shift. My manager was a super chill 25-year-old stoner skate punk who didn't care at all as long as you got your work done and hit your targets. I was able to read, do homework, or play games behind the counter when there was nothing else to do, and the dress code was minimally enforced. So one day I was working with the manager behind the counter, wearing jeans, a black colored shirt, my typical hot topic goth male makeup, and pentagram necklace. It was a slow day, and the manager was doing inventory on one of the two registers, while I worked on the never-ending task of alphabetizing game cartridges behind the counter. A mom came, about 40 years old, and came up to the counter to buy an Xbox 360 controller for her son. I stopped alphabetizing and greeted her with a smile at register number two. Hi, I can ring that up for you right here. She snapped, I'll wait. The manager and I exchanged a confused glance. He said, is there a reason that she can't help you? I'm in the middle of doing inventory, so it's going to be a while before I'm available. I don't like her necklace. It's satanic. I looked at my manager in shock and surprise, then just slowly lowered myself back behind the counter to continue alphabetizing while trying to stifle my laughter. So we complied with her request and let her wait 10 more minutes for the manager to finish up, lest her Xbox controller get cursed by my evil 17-year-old goth fingers. After she left, my manager said to me, her kid's probably playing effing Call of Duty with that controller too. Okay, so I don't know too much about the symbolism behind pentagrams, but down in the comments, people are saying that in the face that actually use pentagrams, pentagrams typically represent like protection or warding off from evil. So in a way, I guess it kind of worked. Our next Reddit post is from Die Ringer. So this all started with me purchasing a lawnmower at Lowe's. I walked in one day looking to finally purchase a new mower, and I was in luck because they had a hot deal on a display model. Unprepared to be going home with a new mower that day, I didn't bring my truck. So I simply asked if I could set the mower aside and come back in a little bit with my truck. I returned maybe 30 minutes later, picked up my mower, and went home. This should be the end of the story, but weirdly, it isn't. Fast forward about two weeks later, and I get a call from Lowe's telling me that my mower is ready for pickup. Confused, I replied, pardon me? So they reminded me that I ordered a mower about two weeks ago, and it just arrived and it's awaiting pickup. Now, I know that most people would have taken advantage of Lowe's mistake to get a free mower, but I decided to be a good person and I explained to the employee that no, I didn't order a mower. I bought a floor model and set it aside to pick it up later, which I did. The employee thanks me, apologizes for the confusion, and says that he'll update the order. So for clarity, OP purchased a lawnmower and took it home, but for some reason, Lowe's doesn't realize that OP already got the lawnmower that he paid for. They think that he still needs to pick up this lawnmower that he paid for. So essentially, because of Lowe's mistake, OP could get a buy one get one free lawnmower deal. Well, one week later, they call me again, same thing, and I once again explain why that lawnmower is not mine. They did this once a week for three weeks straight, and after the third time, I tell my wife, I swear if they call me again, I'm going to go pick up my mower. At this point, I'm excited. I'm watching my phone, hoping they'll call, because in my mind, I've earned it at this point, and I want my free mower. Well, lo and behold, week four hits, and guess who calls? I'm now ready to accept my free mower, but I'm also unsure about how this is going to play out. I don't know if it's technically paid for. I don't have a receipt. It seems like a long shot. So I simply tell the employee I'm so sorry that I haven't been in to get it yet. I said that I got called out of work and I just got back, so I have no idea where I put the receipt. The employee kindly replies, Oh, no worries. It's paid in full, so all you need is a photo ID matching the name of the order. Perfect! 
I call the wife to let her know that I'm picking up our new mower, and she just laughs, still positive that once I get there, they won't have a mower to give me. But you'll be happy to know that I pull in, tell customer service that I'm here for my mower, show them my ID, and next thing you know, some guy in a tow motor is lowing a brand new, in-the-box, unassembled mower into the back of the truck, and off I go. I still have that mower today. I thought about returning the original afterwards, but I just got nervous that it would somehow raise the alarms. Then I thought about selling it on Facebook Marketplace, but shortly after all this I bought a new house and my best friend put a lot of hours helping me move and he had also been looking for a new mower, so I just gave it to him as a way to say thank you. I genuinely tried telling Lowe's that it wasn't my mower, but they insisted that it was and it'd be rude to refuse their offer. Down in the comments we had this story from Fix My Bug. I went to Walmart a few weeks ago to pick up a box of 10 reams of paper for my work truck. They had two options, one ream for $10 or a case of 10 reams for $50. Well, I really go through paper, so I pick up the case of 10. I take it to self-checkout. I only find one barcode on the box that'll scan and it rings up for $10. I call the cashier over and explain that it rang up the wrong price and I show her on the website that it should be 50 bucks. So she voids it and looks for another barcode. There isn't a second one. So she scans the one barcode and it rings up for $10. She also uses her handheld device and scans it. $10. She looks at me and dead ass says, Not my problem. You want it for $10? Hell yeah, I do. She says, There you go, and walks away. I have a similar story from my mother. So my mom, my mom's a boomer, and as a boomer, she likes to watch QVC. And they had some like issue on their website where they were selling jewelry and apparently someone put in the decimal in the wrong spot. So instead of selling this like really pretty ring for I think it was like $500, it sold for $50. And <laughs> my mom immediately realized what they did. And before they could change it, she bought like 20 of these rings. So now, my mom has this ring, my wife has this ring, my brother's girlfriend has this ring, all of my wife's friends have one of these rings, a couple of her co-workers have this ring, and she was so excited about this deal that she would not stop talking about it for like two months straight. And like, <laughs> you know how old people just tell the same story over and over and over, and they don't realize you've heard this story like 20 times, but it gives them so much joy. So whenever I see my mom wearing this ring, I'm always like, Hey mom, that's a really pretty ring. Where'd you get it? And she's like, oh my gosh, let me tell you. And then she enthusiastically goes through this long story about how she got the deal of a lifetime. And I think her telling that story brings her more joy than the actual ring itself. Our next Reddit post is from Wildcat. My family runs a small trucking company. Depending on where you are in the world, you might call us a P&D company, a final mile company, a white glove company, etc. Basically, we handle the kind of stuff that you might buy to have delivered to your home or business that's too big for someone like UPS to deliver, but not big enough for a tractor trailer to haul, and or stuff that actually needs to be brought into the home and set up, like furniture, appliances, etc. A lot of the stuff that we've hauled over the years is stuff going to small stores that can't take delivery by large truck, construction sites where large trucks can't get in or out, and neighborhoods and large complexes. And to be clear, we don't work for the people buying the stuff. We work for the people selling or shipping the stuff. And since we tend to see the same business owners a lot, we've developed great relationships with them over the years. We're not rich, but we've been pretty comfortable over the years. Our one major stressor has been a longtime shipper who has become increasingly demanding as time went on. Now, when I say long time, I mean it. We made our first delivery for them over 50 years ago. Our company has been doing business with them longer than any of their current employees or management staff have been there. There was one point not too long ago where the retired guy who came in a few hours a day to sweep our warehouse because he was bored sitting at home literally knew more about this shipper system than their senior field rep who was supposed to be supervising our operations. We've been a small but vital part of their network for so long that almost no one at that company really realized how much we did for them. We've seen their field reps come and go. Some have been great, some have been a little challenging, but most of them, once they realized what we do, have largely left us alone to do our jobs. 
One even called us when he took over our area to ask, who are you guys? Because his predecessor had no notes on us at all because he never had to visit. We'd just been quietly plugging along, taking care of their customers, in some cases for generations. Well, their latest rep was a genuinely unpleasant person. He was arrogant, abrasive, and casually insulted our employees. He was not someone that we wanted to work with. But I'm able to put on a happy face and get along with just about anyone, when necessary, so onward we strode. As I said earlier, this shipper had been getting more and more demanding as time went on. Systems had been getting harder to navigate. Inventory had been getting harder to track. Getting in touch with people had become more complicated. More and more layers of bureaucracy had been added. And with every change, they'd grown less agile, slower, and more difficult to deal with. One day, the field rep called because he didn't like how we'd answered an email. Not that we hadn't answered it, just that he didn't like the manner in which it had been answered. After decades of dealing with the shipper, being micromanaged at that level was not something that we were interested in. Our manager who was dealing directly with him tried to defuse the situation, but it kept getting worse until the field rep said, If you aren't happy with the way things are going, maybe you should just quit. Oh. Okay then. We ran the numbers, looked at all of our other business, and decided that we could, indeed, go on without them. So then I called their field rep to have a frank conversation with them. Then I wrote a short, polite, direct letter to our customer of over 50 years telling them that we were firing them. We didn't just pull the plug on them, we gave them a full 60 days notice so they would have time to get something worked out. And they didn't. We've always been here for them. They've never had to worry about it. They had someone they thought was going to be a replacement. But, well, as of today, most of their customers in this area haven't had deliveries in a week. Some even longer than that. Many of them don't even know when they'll get their next shipment. That field rep might still have a job when everything is said and done, but it's not our problem anymore. Our phone keeps ringing with people asking for their freight from that shipper, and we just say, sorry, you have to call them. That was our slash malicious compliance, and if you like this content, check out my podcast where I publish the exact same episodes. Also, hit that subscribe button because I put out new Reddit videos every single day.